Okay, I guess we're live. Um, we're here at my house in Denver, Colorado, and my daughter is asleep upstairs, so hopefully she won't wake up uh, while I narrate. Um, and we're going to start by uh, sketching, well, I mean, the only thing I'm going to do is sketch my daughter's new tricycle, which let me see if I can show you. There's a shot of it right there. And brand new. I thought it was an interesting object around the house that I have not drawn yet. Thanks for joining, Daniel. Thanks for joining, Deb. And uh, let me know if you guys can't see what I'm doing, if you need me to move the camera or anything. Um, and what I'm going to use today is I'm going to use my Hero M86 fountain pen which is a bench nib fountain pen I'll show you what a bench nib looks like so that's it and this was a gift from Daniel Wong not Dan Daniel Wong excuse me Alvin Wong <laughs> and uh, anyway I really like this pen unfortunately it's no longer made um, Alvin was really generous to give me he's given me two of these now so uh, thanks Alvin wherever you are and the ink I'm going to use is Noodler's Lexington Gray ink. I hope my pen has plenty of ink in it. Um, but if not, I can put some in. Um, unfortunately, you can't read the label very well anymore because uh, this is a well-used bottle. Alrighty. Uh, another ink I like to use, just just for as an aside, is this Platinum Carbon ink, which is uh, a black ink. Um, it's the only really waterproof fountain pen ink I've ever found and uh, I think it was Donald Colley who turned me on to this one this is really good too but I kind of like the gray ink because it's not nearly so harsh so we're not going to use pencil or anything we're just going to dive right in and let's see if I can frame it so that I know where my boundaries are here cool all right here we go So I'm starting kind of in the center of the mass of this tricycle. I have no idea where it's going to go from here because I haven't drawn a pencil sketch first. I'm just going to wing it and see where it goes. So what I like the most about these bent nib pens is that depending on the angle, you get a nice fine line or you get a nice fat line. It's all about how you hold it. So I'm using, you might notice I'm using it upside down to get the finest line that this particular pen can give me. Feel free to type any questions, I can see them on the screen, and I'll answer them verbally. Obviously can't type. Some texture, some knurling on the uh, handlebars there. So far, so good. I don't hear my daughter crying upstairs, which means I haven't woken her up. <laughs> Sometimes my voice can be a little loud. It reverberates around the house. Good to see a bunch of you that I know joining the group. Hi, Mary Lynn. Okay. 
all that safety webbing and safety straps that they have on kits, toys and kids objects is crazy. We have between our high chair and I have sketched with watercolors, yeah. It's uh you have to go back in my history a little bit and you'll find some of my watercolors. I do them every hundred drawings or so. Um, Emma, yeah, uh, this is a Hero M86 fountain pen. It's a bent nib fountain pen. As you can see, the nib is bent and that gives you a wide variety of line weights. But yeah, there's just so much stuff going on with uh, kids toys especially like I said my high chair and strollers and various things it's kind of crazy so you might notice that I hold my fingers kind of well away from the point of the drawing tool everybody is a little different so there's not I don't think there's right or right or wrong way to do it but I used to hold it right up close like this and I found that I was getting a lot of finger fatigue my hand was getting stressed out so now I kind of hold it pretty far away and a little bit looser and it didn't take too long to kind of get used to that way of holding it Anyway, thanks everybody for joining me. This is my first ever Facebook Live. So, we'll see how well this goes. And I hope, hopefully, I'll do a bunch more of them. I'm getting, good, getting a good response so far. So, If I miss your question on the feed, if it scrolls past and I don't answer it, feel free to type it again. I won't get mad. I am kind of multitasking here, so. Thanks, Jose. Thank you, Lisa. I definitely will. That's a good question, Daniel. How much time do I spend on my art? Boy. Um, if you were to ask me, I'd say not enough. But if you were to ask my wife, um, <laughs> way too much. But I am a full-time stay-at-home dad. So that, and, and of a 19-month-old, so that is a, a real job. Um, so between the dishes and the laundry and the taking her out and going places and grocery shopping and cooking and all that stuff, I don't draw as much as I want to, or maybe as much as I used to, but I still get get to draw a lot, because she does like to nap. Deb, uh, you know, the ink doesn't dry super quick. It's, it's, it's always a kind of a question of both the ink and the paper you're using. I forgot to mention that I'm drawing in a Stillman & Burn Epsilon soft cover sketchbook, and Stillman & Burn has a surface sizing as well as an internal sizing and that surface sizing can make certain inks kind of stay wet to the touch a little longer than others. Um, so I always try to keep the heel of my hand away from the uh, the paper. But it does dry fairly quickly, I think. Um, but you know, it's they're all so different in circumstances. Everything dries different here, or dries quickly here in Colorado. Thanks for the stay-at-home dad shout-out. It's the best job in the world, so I wouldn't trade it for anything. Okay, 
so we're still doing the seat in case you're wondering if you don't have you can't really see the uh, <laughs> the tricycle that I'm drawing right now it's kind of got a bunch of elaborate parts to it <laughs> so let's see here so this is still the seat Working my way up. It's funny, I've never done this before, so I have my phone is kind of out in front of my drawing, so I kind of have to crane my neck a little bit and focus a little harder. Which is why, if I'm going silent, that's why. <laughs> if I'm not saying anything interesting, although I'm rarely convinced that I say anything interesting. Paolo, this is a from life. I don't really ever draw from photos unless it's uh, for an illustration. But for my sketchbooks, I always draw from life. I'm actually way more comfortable drawing from life than I am from a photo. That's a good question, though. Daniel, I do some commercial illustration for a variety of different clients. Um, I teach. I have three courses at Craftsy.com. Um, I previously, before the stay-at-home dad thing, I taught art at the university level, starting at Montana State University, and then um, in Texas for about three years, and then here in Denver for about two years at Red Rocks Community College. Uh, but how do I sell my art? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, most of my art is in sketchbooks and hard to remove. And I'm not somebody who likes to cut pages out of his sketchbooks. So um, I kind of shot myself in the foot by choosing that way of working. But I do sell prints locally here in Denver from time to time. And if you contact me, um, we can always work on you know, a uh, either a commission piece, I've done some commissions recently, or something I've already done in the past. Um, I'd like to get everything up on a uh, on an online store at some point. That's just a, one of the many goals I have for the future. Daniel, what was my very first drawing? You know, I, I don't remember the very first drawing. My mom is an artist, and she encouraged me to draw from a very, very early age. But I do remember in kindergarten, uh, like my kindergarten teacher had a conference with my parents to tell them she was really impressed with my drawing because I wasn't drawing stick figures. We had we all had to do a drawing of our family, and uh, and I didn't draw stick figures. I drew three-dimensional looking people and so my kindergarten teacher thought that was interesting um, Paolo can you tell us what object you're drawing now I'm drawing I'm gonna I'll pan it over again I'm drawing my child's tricycle which is a really weird looking thing especially when it's not complete when I add the wheels it'll look a little bit better but it's <laughs> right now it's a little strange um, I'm gonna scroll down here Silva, when you draw from life, what are my tricks to nailing perspective, especially the fisheye perspective? You know, that is, it's hard to explain, especially while I'm in the process of drawing, because there's a lot going on, but uh, I think perspective is a, um, it's a tricky thing to understand intuitively, 
But once you get to a point where you have kind of an intuitive understanding of it, uh, at least for me, I like to play with that then. Once you know the rules, you can kind of break them, I think is uh, to paraphrase an expression. So I like to play with perspective. And I first noticed the fisheye thing when I was drawing in Bozeman. And so I've been exploring that idea for a long time now. And I've done hundreds, if not thousands, of drawings kind of exploring that. And so it's, it's definitely taken me a while to get to the point where I, you know, I think about perspective the way that I do now. David, do I always sketch from pen and ink first? Uh, no, sometimes I use pencil, especially with the more the trickier perspective drawings. Um, I go into pencil to kind of map out where everything is. And then, oh, we're about to start on the wheels. And then I, uh, then I'll go in with pen and ink, but Lately, I mostly just go straight in with pen and ink, even in the perspective drawings. For small drawings like this, I don't really bother with pencil at all because they don't take very long, and I really don't need to be drawing an entire drawing twice. So, and that's what it feels like when you draw in pencil first, for me at least. That's funny, Deb. Daniel, yeah, I've used moleskins a lot. Um, I think I was pretty much exclusively using moleskins for the first five or so years as an urban sketcher or part of this kind of sketching community. And uh, and then I was introduced to Stillman and Byrne. I've used a bunch of other um, multimedia and mixed media type books as well. Um, I'll still use a moleskin from time to time, but Stillman and Byrne for me is the most... Um, suitable for the the kind of ink I work with now and um, but there's nothing wrong with moleskins for the most part um, especially that they've improved them a lot lately too they used to not take wet media very well and I like the sketchbook kind Hi, Emily. Good to see you. Or hear from you. <laughs> so this is the front wheel of the trike. Normally I'm pretty quiet when I draw. So the drawing and talking thing definitely a challenge. <laughs> Daniel, yeah, I have done sculpture. I think I started um, as a sculptor in, uh, in uh, college and before I moved to painting. Um, and then my bachelor's degree and master's degree are both oil painting, but um, before that, I was into welding. I did these big, elaborate steel sculptures. And uh, I didn't have a vehicle back then, so it was a lot harder to do that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's why I made the practical decision at the time to do more two-dimensional work. But I've always drawn. I think drawing is my, my most comfortable um, practice. But yeah, um, you've been carving, yeah, spoons from wood. I want to do that, actually. I do some woodworking, um, and I also, let me see, as far as the art world, the broader non-visual art world, um, I'm also a musician, so I do that from time to time, more as a hobby now. But when I was in my 20s, I was still, I think, a hobby, but I was a little bit more serious about it. It's going off the uh, the edge. Thanks for letting me know. Yeah, Tom, I do use uh, wash too, and actually I brought one of the water brushes that I use. Um, and this water brush has uh, diluted gray ink inside, 
So it's good for washes and things like that when I don't want to use hatching for my values. Um, so I am, yeah, I do other medium. But yeah, I think I, your larger meaning is that my garage workshop indicates I, I'm a woodworker. But I'm not a very talented woodworker, at least not compared to drawing and painting. So i got a few more years before I feel remotely comfortable doing that. The thickness of the texture and paper. This is an Epsilon paper from Stillman and Byrne. Uh, I wouldn't wouldn't be able to tell you exactly the thickness, but it's um, it's a wet media suitable paper. Here's kind of a an idea what it feels like. It's pretty flexible and it's somewhat transparent. It's not like a 140 pound cold press watercolor. I like it because it's smooth and it does take ink washes fairly decent. And Microns over fountain pens? Well, I used Microns probably almost exclusively until about two years ago or three years ago. And then uh, started getting more and more into fountain pens. But uh, Microns are great. They're waterproof. You can get any kind of line variety um, depending on the kinds that you get. And uh, they're cheap. So that's the that's the best part. They're archival too, so they last and last. So nothing wrong with the Micron. Um, I'm not a snob when it comes to art supplies, but I do like to try all the different kinds, and I am kind of concerned about archival qualities um, in my art supplies. So I do like, hopefully, I do like to choose the ones that that will last. But you know, I like to play with all sorts of things. The problem with most found pen inks is they are not uh, extremely light fast which means they can fade and they're not mostly waterproof either so they're not a high, very archival medium but they are a lot of fun for me thanks for joining us Daniel good questions I'm going to turn on my baby monitor and see if I have awoken the beast. Nope, she's still out. Okay. All right, let's see here. I wish I could zoom out on this, but this is as far as my camera will get from the page. So I'll, I'll make sure you guys can see what I'm doing as I continue here. I'm working on the saddle now or the seat. If I've missed any questions, just let me know. The ink is Noodler's uh, Lexington Gray, which you can kind of read. It's somewhat faded, but it's a uh, it's a water-based ink. Uh, works great in fountain pens. That's what it was designed for. Um, and I like it because it's a little softer uh, than black inks, which can seem a little harsh sometimes. So I really enjoy working with it. Um, and I've been working with it now for about six months. And uh, so far, I love it. So I'm gonna, I'll do a little bit of a wash to show you guys for some of these values here. So this is diluted Lexington Gray in a, uh, it looks like Sakura, a Koi, yeah, it's a Koi water brush. I think. Jeffrey, that's this is sort of a test for my Facebook Live, and then I think I'm going to do that. 
I want to take it out on the road and do it in do an, an, an interior with the, all the perspective stuff that I like to do. Um, it would be a pretty involved sketch. Those usually take me a few hours. But if you're willing to stick it out or at least join me for part of it, you could see kind of how I do what I do with perspective. Thank you so much. Uh, Silva, what artists influence me the most? You know, I love a lot of artists. These days, I wouldn't say I'm influenced anymore so much as uh, I kind of, I see things I really like and react to them. But man, I have so many artists. Um, for a long time, I was getting, my work was drawing comparisons to people like Robert Crumb, uh, especially my more illustrative kind of stuff. Uh, this right here is a water brush, but earlier I was using a Fude nib or a bent nib fountain pen right here. But now I'm using a water brush. Um, other artists, let me think, boy. Artists that are working right now, I really like Donald Colley out of Chicago. Um, I love Gerard Michel uh, in Belgium. He's one of my favorites. I think he's a lot of people's favorites. Uh, boy, it's hard to say. There's so many good ones. We have a William um, Cordero Hidalgo hanging in our living room. If you haven't followed him, at least in the Urban Sketchers community, you should check his work out. He's amazing. Met him in uh, in Brazil in 2014 at the symposium and love his work. Osama, that's a good question. It's more than I can talk about here, but I want to do some more videos that talk about spherical or curved perspective or circular perspective. Uh, it's a lot of trial and error for me. That's how I learned. I didn't realize there was a right or wrong way to do it until I'd been kind of doing it intuitively for a long time. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a challenge, but I've been having a lot of fun doing it. And really, I don't do anything the correct way um, in terms of perspective. I just do them the way I think is going to be the most visually interesting. And so I think the challenge for me is how to explain what I'm doing when I'm not doing it the correct way. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's taken a lot of practice over the last 10 years to kind of come to the point that I've come to with perspective. Um, but I do have a, there's a craftsy class that I teach about sketching your point of view. That's the name of the class. And it talks a lot about that in depth. It's about 90 minutes of content. And uh, there are some blog posts and other things if you Google around um, you can find that. If you want m more precise information there's a great book called Extreme Perspective by David Chelsea that uh, talks about spherical and circular perspective uh, in, in depth. Far more um, professionally than I could talk about it. I'm going to tilt this a little bit so you guys can see more of this drawing. There we go. That's a little bit better. Sorry about the angle. It's a little bit distorted, but it gives you a better idea of what I'm doing here. Okay. So there's no rhyme or reason to how I move about the, um, the drawing. It's just sort of whatever area I'm, I'm interested in tackling next. So there's a little basket or a bucket behind the, the tricycle. And that's what I'm drawing now. Doing some cross hatching. Hopefully this all makes sense when I'm done, but we'll see. <laughs> it's funny, when you work live, it's different than when I post something on the internet because I always have the choice whether or not to post it 
and if I don't like it then it doesn't doesn't ever see the light of day but here I'm kind of <laughs> kind of forced to show you what I'm doing I think that could use a little bit of wash. Just going around looking for areas that I think need some darker areas. If you're joining us, I'll show you again what I'm drawing. This is my daughter's new tricycle, which she's a little bit small for, so I haven't seen a lot of use yet. But I thought it was a great object for sketching. It just looks really cool. So, and I thought I would just share my sketching with you guys today. So thank you for coming. And feel free to ask questions, even if you think it might have been asked before. If you didn't hear my answer, I'm happy to repeat myself. When it's all done, I'll hold it at a more um, reasonable angle so you can see what it looks like. Because especially with the foreshortening on the wheels, it's probably even stranger looking at this angle. Although I didn't, I definitely <laughs> didn't do such a great job on the front wheel. So. We're getting there. We're almost done in the, uh, the home stretch, as they say. One thing I'll say, perspective-wise, with ellipses, wheels, and you know the tops and bottoms of cylinders, is the angle that they recede away from you is always a little bit counterintuitive. Um, if something's kind of to the left of you, it's going to kind of tilt at the top to the left. Um, I don't, I don't have a really <laughs> precise way of describing that phenomenon. But look at photos of things like cars, and, uh, especially the wheels, but anything else that has foreshortened ellipses, and kind of take, you know, take a close look at what direction that ellipse seems to tilt um, and that's really how I learned was to just look at those kinds of things and say well what I think intuitively is not right they're definitely doing something but I I'm not sure what hi Corinna uh, Jean-Paul this nib yeah let's see here it's definitely it wasn't easy at first and, and I like precision, and it doesn't always give you the most precision. But I've gotten better and better at it over the past six months or so. So it's certainly, you notice I keep turning it. I, I like the, uh, the fine line most of the time. A lot of people will probably use the thick line more often than I do. Um, but I use the thick line like a marker just to come in for areas that I think need to be dark. You notice when I did the... The seat belt, this right here, I used the, the fat side.
to do it. Any areas that are going to be real dark. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of super dark areas in this particular scene. So not a lot of opportunities to, to use it. Thanks for thanks for coming. Yeah, I it's definitely <laughs> it's interesting with lots of people asking questions, but I I'm, I'm actually having a lot of fun. I'm sure the more comfortable I get, the better I will be at explaining what I'm doing. I'm getting off the page here. I'll tell you something funny about this uh, tricycle. It has a stroller bar attachment, which you can remove later when um, your child learns to pedal. And it has a little tray for a drink. But the stroller bar, it steers the wheel. And when you turn to the side, the tray tilts about 45 degrees. So you can't really put a drink on there unless, um, unless it's uh, closed and also super glued onto the tray. Otherwise, it's going to fall right out, which we, if we had read the reviews more carefully, we would have seen that. <laughs> Hi, Beverly. Uh, no, I didn't start with pencil. This one, I just decided to start dry, drawing right in, uh, in pen. And uh, for smaller sketches like this, they go quicker, and I find that it doesn't really... Um, make them less or more accurate if I, I draw in pencil first anyway. So I like to kind of go right in with pen and then they have a little bit more spontaneity and uh, and they take a lot less time. With some of the more elaborate perspective sketches I definitely often I will start with uh, pencil because I have no idea what I'm, where I'm going to be going or how much I'm going to be able to fit in to the sketch if I don't. But for this one, I felt comfortable with the uh, pencil, but as or with, with pen. But as you can see, I still ran out of room, so it doesn't always work out. But I'm not worried. It's coming along. You guys are welcome to critique it too and tell me if you think something's not working. <laughs> Osama, you should do however you feel comfortable. Um, if you feel more comfortable doing pencil, at, at first at least, then that's how you should do it. Um, that's how I did it for the longest time. And then, after a while, I became convinced that I could probably do it without the pencil and get a very similar result, which is true. It, 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 they, I didn't notice there was much of a difference in the drawing. You definitely should try it to see if you're going to be comfortable um, working just with the pen. Um, try it first, and, uh, and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Perseus, yes, this is... Um, a wash with gray ink, Lexington gray ink, mixed with water. Um, so it's a heavily diluted ink um, versus my pen, which is straight up gray ink. When I draw with pencil, I mostly map out the basics. So I don't really, I mean, I was exaggerating a little bit when I say I'm drawing twice. But um, it's mostly the understructure that I draw with pencil and not, you know, the details. So I don't really end up drawing it completely twice in a row. That's, that's a little bit of exaggeration. Thanks, Deb.
normally when I'm drawing, I'm dividing my time between looking at the object and looking at the sketchbook. And this is looking at three things. It's because I keep glancing over at the screen to see if you guys are asking questions. So, <laughs> but you know what? I don't think it's made a big difference in the sketch, which is fine. Yes, uh, Perseus, when I do the, the more elaborate uh, perspective drawings, I definitely start with pencil uh, most of the time. And that gives me a little bit more um, safety in terms of planning out where things are going to be and how they, um, how they end up all fitting on the page or not. Um, because it's definitely definitely a challenge to go straight in with pen and hope your proportions and your scale and everything are going to be accurate because more often than not I have to do some correcting. Um, Silva, do I ever draw from memory? You know, if I'm doing like cartooning or illustration or something like that, yes. Um, and sometimes in urban sketching, when the light changes or a, an important object moves, um, I also We'll try and remember what it looked like, but most of the time I'm I'm kind of I'm scared of my ability to recall. Um, I, I'd rather trust the visual information in front of me than my memory, um, because uh, I like to think of drawing from observation as sort of an open book test. So it's like you have your notes or your or the 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 text right in front of you, um, and then you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to remember any information, <laughs> which is what I like about it. Um, Iris or Iris, uh, when did I start drawing? Before I can remember, I think. Um, but I, you know, as a, skillfully drawing, maybe when I was four or five years old, I think I started. Um, Perseus, yeah, it's not fully penciled yet, but the basic axes, the guidelines, the structure, the under, the understructure. So a framework. I'll definitely draw a framework with pencil. I won't do anything like hatching or even where the values are, where the shading is going to be in pencil. Just that's just too time consuming if I plan to go back with pen. I think the wheels need to be a bit darker. I'll show you guys again. Here's the here is the tricycle. I hope I managed to say everybody's names correctly. I'm sorry if I didn't, I apologize. I think I'm gonna do a shadow with the washer. Let's get it a little further. You're welcome. The nice thing about washes, and I, at first I wasn't fearless enough to do this, but now I can go in, I like to manipulate them with my fingers, and that makes them seem a little more organic and gets rid of some of the tide marks that brushes tend to leave behind. So you can get softer edges with your washes, especially if you don't have a clean brush and clean water to lay down beforehand. In, in watercolor or in true ink wash, you can lay down water first and then you get a much more diffused wash layer. But since I'm only working with one water brush, I don't have that, um, that ability. So I just go right in with my fingers.
Mike, no, I've never used an airbrush, believe it or not. Here, I'm I'm all about portability. And I since I mostly draw on location. So an airbrush, I know you can bring compressed air in a can along with you, but changing colors and ink and all that stuff, it's a lot of it's a tricky process. I would like to use an airbrush, especially for my illustration work and some of the other hobbies I have. So I plan to one day <laughs> uh, maybe get a hold of an airbrush and, and play around with it, but not lately, not or not probably anytime soon. Uh, yes, actually, Perseus, that's a good question. Um, the 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 ink isn't really waterproof here, so it does the ink lines from the pen do um, do become a little bit diffused by the water. Uh, but not to the point where I think the the drawing suffers. I think I actually like that effect, so it doesn't bother me. Let's see. I think I'm almost done. There's a little bit of... This is a wood floor, so I think I want to put some of the lines down. This is where the perspective gets emphasized. This is my favorite part. Um, when I draw an interior space, I often look at the floor or the ceiling because those visually activate the space for me. And they can also give you cues as to what the perspective uh, will be in the sketch. And when you don't have that, when you just have a, a blank floor without any tile or wood, um, I don't think they're as interesting. I think they're very hard to draw and, and make them into an interesting sketch. Jean-Paul, some uh, Noodler ink is waterproof, or as they say, bulletproof is what the uh, what they're called on their uh, on their packaging. But I don't think I think Lexington Gray is described that way. I'm not sure. However, um, I think their claims are a little um, a little bit of exaggeration. I don't think any of their inks are truly waterproof. I think they'll all lift a little bit. They So they lift up, but they do not blur, um, which is what I really uh, don't want. I don't want spidering of the ink. Um, so if they lift and they get a little bit lighter, that doesn't bother me. Um, but if they, the ink starts to smudge and smear around with the water, uh, then I wouldn't use the ink. So, But the only one, and I mentioned this way at the beginning, there probably weren't very many people watching. The only fountain pen ink that I've seen that is truly 100% waterproof is platinum carbon ink, um, which you can find online and in art supply stores. Um, it's expensive, but it really, really does work, and it's the only thing that um, works in a fountain pen without clogging it too badly. I still clean my fountain pens fairly, fairly regularly. You might notice that the cap is really beat up on this, but I use a... Um, an ultrasonic cleaner to clean the nibs of my pens um, every few weeks or so. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I, I agree. The the lines of the the wooden floor really they make everything um, perspective wise. They make it work a lot a lot better, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. That's why I chose this particular place. <laughs> Sure. So the brush that I'm using, it is a Kuratake. I th earlier I think I said it was um, Sakura, which makes a very similar brand. I don't know if you can read it, but in the light it says Kuratake, and it's a water brush. Uh, so it's nylon tip, and there's a water reservoir inside. Um, and uh, this is a, I think the medium tip, it's not the 
maybe it's the fine. Sorry. Sorry about that. I had a phone call just now. Uh, anyway, but yeah, it's a, a fine or medium tip, I think. And, uh, and it has a really big reservoir. They make smaller ones, which are better for travel, but this is just about the same size as a pen or pencil, so I don't know why you would really need the small, small one. Because the more I have, the, the less I have to refill it, which is nice. And then I use a syringe, which I'll show you, to fill that and my fountain pen. Let me see if I can find it. I'm not sure uh, where you can find these. And actually, <laughs> the label has uh, washed off. But they're typically used for masking fluid for watercolor. And they have a needle pen. Uh, Jean-Paul, the pen is a hero. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. It's a hero M86 uh, Fude nib, which is like a sailor. I do have the sailor ones too. But I put my gray ink in here, and then I can travel with lots and lots of extra gray ink. I need to refill it. But um, anyway, and it has a needle point, and it has a, a wire inside the cap to keep the needle uh, from clogging. And then I can take the converter reservoir from my pen and just fill it. without so I don't drop it into the uh, the inkwell anymore because I'm not usually traveling with the inkwell so I'll show you exactly what I do and I find that this is also a little bit cleaner because there's no ink on the outside of the pen so I'll show you how I fill it up so I can get it deep inside there Get some bubbles sometimes, but that's about it. <laughs> oh, I understand your concern. I'm not too worried about the sketch. And then you do end up with dirty fingers a lot, but that's, that's, uh, I think that's appropriate if you're an artist. There we go. And then to get the ink flowing, if it's been a while, I do a couple of these just to get the ink going. If that doesn't work, then I have I have a pretty good idea that the, the nib is clogged. And in that case, that's when I go and clean it. But uh, most of the time, I don't ever have to clean it because I keep it filled and I keep using it. So I'm always drawing with it. So I think this drawing is just about done. In a second, I'll change the angle here so you can see it a little bit better. But it's also, my daughter is probably done with her nap, so I'll have to go soon. <laughs> I want to thank you guys for joining me. This has uh, been a lot of fun and very interesting experience, and I hope to do it again. Before I go, I'll also show you the method I used to capture my uh, drawing. So I have a drawing board here and that I've made, and the bottom of it has an attachment for a uh, tripod, which I'll show you. So there's a little metal plate that you can buy, and um, then this is made by Joby, the same people who make Gorillapod. I'm not sure who makes the uh, tripod for the phone but I like this clamp because I can clamp it to my drawing board and if I want to do a time-lapse video or capture a drawing that's a good way to do it um, and yes I did make the uh, the drawing board it's just a uh, plywood hobby plywood and I cut off part of it and glued it this way so I have a little lip to rest my sketchbook on this is elastic webbing that you can buy at a fabric store and there's little rubber screw-on feet, and I screwed the screw through the webbing so that the, they're nice and taut, and that keeps the pages from blowing away if I'm outside. Most of the time I work on my lap, but I have this set up specifically for if I'm going to film a drawing. Well, anyway, thank you guys very much. 
I really enjoy everybody's questions and uh, so happy everybody could come and, and join me for this session. Uh, I hope to do this again regularly, so I will definitely let you know ahead of time when I plan to do it. Uh, thanks to everybody one more time and uh, we'll see you next time. All right. Bye-bye.